She's an award-winning YouTuber and best-selling author obsessed with helping you go after the life you want. I like it. Join her as she seeks out the stories and strategies. Give me every little detail. Of extraordinary people who found success. I'm going to get emotional. Oh, my God. Welcome to Detail Therapy with Amy Landino. Once you show a proclivity towards being, um, you know, great at something, there's a lot of people that want to help you become great because it's, it's exciting. And, you know, one thing I will say about every single Olympian that you ever see on television is they have a massive team behind them supporting them. And I had a great team. Hey there, welcome to Detail Therapy. You just heard a snippet from Amy's chat with two-time Olympian, Run Gum CEO, and mountain climber Nick Simmons. We'll get to unpack all of that in just a bit. In this episode, you'll hear Nick and Amy discuss Nick's daily routines and how they've changed from his college days to his Olympic priorities and now his retired days. We're also going to discuss his entrepreneurial spirit and the how and why behind his founding of Run Gum. And on to the truth the real truth, on his Wikipedia page. If you're relatively new to the podcast, I'm Meg Kearns. I'm filling in for Amy for a bit on these next couple of episodes while she spends time with her family. I'm the co-host of the Life, Marriage, and a Baby Carriage podcast that talks about how my husband and I survive life with our three circus clowns. I I mean kids. Personally, I'm always searching for the best ways to be productive and intentional in my daily life, and Amy tends to have and share those details within her discussions on every episode. I'm just soaking it all up. Today's shout out for the podcast review on iTunes is from Kaylee Collier. Kaylee writes, I am loving these podcasts. As a teacher, they really help me reinforce on my why each time I listen. Plus, I learn new and interesting ways to motivate myself and my students. These podcasts are not just for social entrepreneurs or business-minded professionals. This is great advice for everyone in any sector. Yes, Kaylee, 10 out of 10 would recommend. I totally agree with you. Speaking of you all, Amy wants to know just a little bit more about you, the Detail Therapy listeners. She has a quick survey, and by quick, I mean less than two minutes, so that we can keep bringing you all of the best details. Go to amylandino.com slash detail therapy survey. Remember that everything they talk about here on the show can be found on the show notes website, detailspodcast.com. So if you hear Nick talk about a book he enjoys or a passion project he's working on, we'll link to everything as much as possible in the show notes. It's all about the details here, so go get them. With that, let's get into Amy's chat with her next guest. Today, Amy's sitting down in her apartment's penthouse meeting space with two-time Olympian, entrepreneur, podcast host, and spontaneous yes-man, Nick Simmons. Nick is in town for an event and was gracious enough to join today's podcast right after an early morning run. Talk about commitment. Nick and Amy discuss a variety of topics beyond his Olympic journey and his current projects. So without further ado, let's welcome to the show, Nick Simmons. Nick Simmons, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Tell me, why do you run? You know, if you'd asked me that, you know, 20 years ago, it would, it would have been, you know, a totally different answer than today. And probably every year throughout my life, it's a different answer. Today, I run just to stay, stay sane. And it's, it's, um, it's meditative for me, mm-hmm. you know, to be out um, in the morning when it's, you know, nobody's awake and everything's calm and quiet. And it's a great way to start the day. Um, I feel like better for it physically, better for it mentally, better for it emotionally. So it really has become more of like a spiritual thing than an actual fitness thing for me. Talk more about your running history. So you're a two-time Olympian. Mm-hmm. Um, if this is, tell, correct me if I'm wrong, 800 meters both in Beijing in 2008 and in London in 2012. Correct. You reached the semifinals in Beijing, but you actually got fifth place in London. Yeah. And your personal in world, best. In the world record race. Yeah. And, it was, it was yeah. pretty cool to be a part of that. Amazing. I mean, I, I always get so curious. When I watch the Olympics every four or every two years, really, mm-hmm. every time it comes on, I'm thinking, how does someone become an Olympian? Like how, how do you, like what exactly happens in your life? I know that there's, there are sporting events that happen, but what is the thing that happens where you're like, okay, it's time to go try for the Olympics. Like, what does that look like? You know, as a kid, I I was growing up in Boise, Idaho and it was a great place to grow up. And my parents were awesome. I'd come home and I'd say, Hey, I want to try baseball. And we'd go buy me a baseball bat and a glove and I'd try baseball and I'd, you know, be bored with it in three, three days. And I'd I'd say, Hey, I want to go try golf. So they'd give me golf clubs and I'd go try golf. And I was horrible at golf. And basically I tried every single sport there was. And when I was in eighth grade, I said, Hey, you know, my friend's going out for the cross country team. I want to go out for the cross country team. They loved that because all they had to do was buy me a, you know, a stopwatch and some shoes. 
And, uh, you know, that was the one that stuck. I was, I was naturally gifted at distance running and I hated it at the time. I I absolutely hated it, but I I recognized that this was a sport where I was going to see the results of my hard work. If I worked hard, I was going to get faster. I was going to win races. I would get better. I would get, you know, pats on the back and Mm -hmm. maybe one day a scholarship. And and it kind of just seemed like, it just seemed like the the last sport I wanted to be good at, but uh, you know, I, I was good at it. So, you know, once you, once you find a sport like that there, and once you show a proclivity towards being, um, you know, great at something, there's a lot of people that want to help you become great because it's, it's exciting. And, you know, one thing I will say about every single Olympian that you ever see on television is they have a massive team behind them, supporting them. And I had a great team. Um, you know, I, I went to college and, and ran prof- and then, uh, met my coach who is, who's coach Sam. Um, and I'll refer to him a couple of times during this, this interview. Mm-hmm. Um, but he and I kind of just looked at each other and he said, you have what it takes to be an Olympian. And I kind of chuckled. I'm like, no, I don't, I'm running at a division three school. I'm not on an a- academic or an athletic scholarship. And he's like, I know Olympians. And I, what they have in them, I see in you. And so I think that's when it really kind of planted the seed in my mind. Like, okay, I mean, I, maybe if I work hard enough, I could get to the Olympic trials. And that's, a, that's where you get your shot. And so um, my senior year of college, I, I finished second at the U.S. Championships. And the top three Americans each year make the team. And so I thought to myself, if I just stay as good as I am right now, even if I don't improve at all, if I just stay as good as I am right now, in two years in the 2008 Olympic trials, I'll make the team. And, and, you know, Nike saw that in me. And so they sponsored me and I had a coach and a team and, you know, fortunately I I made the team. (laughs) I love how you, um, well, two things I just heard in that one of them is, isn't it kind of funny when you have that moment in your life where somebody tells you something about yourself and it's sort of an aha moment where you heard you have what it takes to be an Olympian. Did you feel like that was like that groundbreaking moment no. where you're like, Whoa. I thought this guy's delusional. <laughs> I'm not joking. I told him to his face. I'm like, coach Sam, I love you, but you are delusional. Um, I'm like, I know I'm a short stocky kid from Idaho. Like yeah. we just don't make Olympic sure. teams and really anything. Like maybe I had a chance in biathlon at some point, but <laughs> you know, like if you look at the genetic makeup of team USA's track and field team, I don't really fit the mold. Um, but I had this, I had a great work ethic um, I was durable and I, I think that in some aspects I've, I have learned to kind of erase self-doubt in some ways, you know, and, Lu- you know, we're here in Columbus and we were listening to Lewis Howes yesterday at the summit of greatness. Mm-hmm. And he was talking about self-doubt and how it's just, you know, the most cancerous thing that seeps into people's lives and really pre- prevents people from being the greatest version of themselves. Mm-hmm. And, um, maybe it's just cause I was raised with, you know, two parents that were always telling me like, you can do anything, you can do everything. And I, I I was delusional enough to think that I could make an Olympic team. That's awesome. Because the other thing I heard you say was that whole, you know, once you're great at something, people will be very supportive of you. They'll, they'll yeah. crowd around you. So and it not really, always it's... just for financial gain. A lot of it is just intrinsic value. I have a dozen people to thank that didn't make a dime off my career, wow. but they just wanted to, they wanted to see how far I could go. It sounds like it started because of your parents, though, right? Because it, it, let's say, I, I think a lot of people hear that, right? We want what somebody has right now. Mm-hmm. right? And in order to get that, we've had to put in a lot of work in order to oh, get yeah. to that point. Who's pushing us before we get to that point? So it sounds like you had a great family, but what else was it that you did that made some, some, a group of people or a person or a coach or Nike or whoever look at you and go like, Hey, you really got something here. Like how, how much of that was just you pushing yourself? I, I would say early on, it was all just me. You know, I, I remember coming home for Christmas break and my parents, they'd be like, you're on break. You don't have to train. I'm like, mm. no, I have to train. And so like Christmas Peer morning, pressure. Christmas morning, you know, everyone wants to wake up and open presents. And I'm like, well, I have a 10 mile run scheduled. So we're not going to be able to open presents till, <laughs> till nine o'clock. So, <laughs> you know, it's like, oh God, it's, I was that, I'm, I'm, I seriously, my, my family. no, no one did. And, and my parents hated traveling with me. Cause I'd have to be like, we have to get this workout in. I have to get my double in. And anyway, I was a pain in the butt, but you know, I just, I just knew that the Kenyans, they were training <laughs> on Christmas morning and I wanted to race them one day yeah. and they were going to beat me if I didn't, if I didn't train. You needed to find your edge. Yeah. And, then... and, and so early on before, before, you know, the corporations and the coaches and everybody saw the potential in me, it was just me. And I would only, I wouldn't even say I saw the potential in myself so much. It was one of these things where I've invested enough time and energy. I, I just, I owe it to myself to see how good I can be. Mm. Um, so, you know, when I was 20, 21, I, I wasn't even on the national stage really, um, probably would not even rank top hundred in the U S 
but I had put a decade of running in and I said, I, I owe it to that 14 year old kid, you know, who, who put all those miles in during the summer when he didn't want to, I owe it to that kid to see how good I can be. And so you kind of start building this thing and you just can't, you can't stop. You have to finish the project. And for me, that meant one, trying to make an Olympic team. And then once I had made Olympic team, it's saying, okay, how far can I take this? How fast can I get? How high can my world ranking get? How much money can I make? Mm. You know, like I wanted to, I wanted to see it through to the end. And I did, I retired last year at the age of 34, uh, no, excuse me, 33, which is like the oldest person <laughs> <laughs> on team USA. That's great. So I, I, I really feel like I got, you know, everything out of my legs that I could get out yeah. of them. And I just feel so blessed. I didn't have the best career. You know, there's a lot of people that ran a heck of a lot faster than me. Um, but I'm one of the few people that truly got to see how good they could be. And, uh, and then I aged out of the sport, which is, it's kind of a, a relieving thing because I, yeah. I never would have quit. I never would have quit. I would have kept banging my head against that wall until literally my body said, you can't run another step. Yeah. Or you could, you could have gotten hurt at yeah. some point or early. financial, a you know, things, a lot of yeah. Olympians run out of financing mm. and, and even at the peak of their career, they have to, they have to retire. Um, I had the financing, I had the support, I had the drive. Um, I would still be running competitively to this day, except my left ankle won't, won't allow mm, me to, um, it's like, Hey bro, we did. It's like, we, we've, while. we've turned a lot of laps, <laughs> you know, let's, let's go do something else. And so now I get to oh jog for fun. Like I said, it's yeah. meditative and I, I run in the mornings for like 30 minutes just to clear my head and get the day started. But the days of, of competitive athletics and, and sprinting around the yeah. track are over for me. Yeah, but when Lewis is like, hey, I need you to lead a run on yeah. the mornings of my conference. And oh, then yeah. It was, it was so great because I tweeted you and I was like, hey, we're at the same conference. I tweeted you. My husband tweeted <laughs> you, actually. My husband is my scout. And uh, he said, hey, can, do you want to be on a podcast while you're in town? And we found time. We found time after your run. It is 7 o'clock in the morning, and yeah. we're in my community space in my building. I just love how we made this work. It's, it's a testament to how committed you clearly have been for a long time and how committed that you are and, and excited when somebody calls on you just to do an extracurricular. Yeah, and we were talking about it just a, just a minute ago, but I'm like, I'm the guy that says yes to everything. Yeah. And sometimes I have to learn to say no because you can kind of like get yourself into this, mm. this hole where you're just overcommitted. Um, but I just, I, I find that if I say yes, nine times out of 10, I'm glad I did, yeah. you know, like sitting here with you guys this morning, I'm enjoying our conversation. It's day. a great way to start the day, <laughs> you know? And, and I think that too many people out there, their first inclination is to say no. Yeah. And I just cannot stand people like that. I'm like, at least hear us hear, hear, hear a person out right yeah, before fair. you say no. But some people just have that no mentality. And I, I find uh, very hard to to relate to them very hard to do business with them or very hard to mm. fi have a friendship with somebody that's constantly saying no yeah I want to talk to you about business before we get there though I want I, I, I want to dig a little bit more on the Olympics what does it look like lifestyle wise let's say during London or or mm -hmm. right bef before you're heading over to London for the Olympics when you yeah. when it comes to your diet when it comes to even what's a healthy amount of exercise what is your workout like you know what is what are your days looking like yeah. when you're leading up to that you know we we use periodization and so when I was off I was off like I'd take two or three weeks off after every season and I was mm -hmm. drinking six pack every night and fishing and just hiking around and not, not a runner not an athlete of any kind but then I would start training and I'd, I'd build this base and you think of it kind of like a pyramid. And so for six months, you know, basically September through March, I'm just putting in 10 miles every single day. I'm building this incredible base of strength. And then the season comes and from April to June, I'm kind of sharpening my legs. I'm, I'm, I'm changing instead of running 70 miles a week, maybe I'm only running 50, but they're a lot more quality, a lot more sprinting on the track, a lot more lifting. And then you get right before the games and you're at that very tippy, tippy top of the pyramid right. and you are as fit as you will ever be. Um, and you're mostly just panicked that you're going to step off the curb wrong or that you're mm. going to get the, get the, uh, food poisoning the night before. Right. And so you're kind of like walking around. I mean, people will literally walk around with masks on for two weeks bleeding into the games because they're so afraid of getting sick and it's a stressful time in somebody's life. You know, you kind of call it like the calm before the storm mm -hmm. and then you know, opening ceremonies happen. And then it's, 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 everything's chaos. You know, like you're just trying to handle the pressure, trying to handle the stress, you know, the athletes village is a, is a yeah. party and you're trying yeah. to like, huh, I have the biggest competition of my life tomorrow and it's three in the morning and I can't sleep. Yeah. And we all have the biggest competition of yeah. our lives and we're not really like, it, I, I can imagine it. it probably is a party and like what, the influence that you guys must be on each other. Cause you're on this high, but yeah. you're also like, we have to f stay focused. Yeah. Um, what is that ceremony like? 
I went to both opening ceremonies, yeah. and it's beautiful. Um, it's fun. It is horrendously hard on the body because – you, like in Beijing, for example, mm-hmm. we're out on our feet for like three hours, oh, you know, yeah. and it's 90 degrees with 100% humidity. And I, we all sweated through a three-piece suit, you know, oh, like it's just yeah. like you're wringing out your suit. <laughs> And you're like, this is probably not the best thing for me to do. I have to race in a couple of days. Like, and I'm, I'm dehydrated. I'm exhausted. But, you know, it's it's just a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Yeah. But, you know, the track and field portion of the Olympic Games is at the latter half of the three weeks. So I had time to recover. Mm-hmm. But some people have a competition the next day. You know, the games kick off right after the ceremony. And, and they'll have to miss those. So yeah. I was grateful that I got to experience the opening ceremonies. And um grateful I didn't get sick or injured while I was Seriously. walking around in my little Ralph Lauren suit. <laughs> <laughs> you talked about this before we started recording that um, they're very strict at the Olympics. I imagine they're strict in a lot of different competitions mm-hmm. now. Um, something as simple as I, I think I heard something about like Ryan Lochte did some silly um, like IV thing and it, yeah. it technically was a violation or something like mm-hmm. that. There's so much restriction around this. We talked about the fact that like even what's in your water bottle could become an issue or drinking coffee might be an issue yeah. you're the ceo of run gum yeah why do i need gum to run and how does that help in sort of these situations that's a great question we call it run gum because it was born from runners created for runners but it's really perfect for anyone on the run mm-hmm. right so if you're running errands or you're running into a meeting or you're actually out running or, or biking you know this is an immediate boost in energy and i loved energy drinks uh, i was sponsored by them and I, I was getting all the products sent to me but it was so hard on my stomach they're really yeah, hard you said you like red bull i can't get into it i think it's, I it smells it. terrible oh see, i Anytime hear that someone leaves a leftover red bull in my refrigerator <laughs> it's like, like sweet like, tarts in a can who d- what I, and never I, and i genuinely like the taste i know people think i'm crazy but what I didn't like was this heavy, acidic liquid sloshing around in my stomach. Mm. I didn't like the calories. I didn't like um, the sugar. I didn't like the carbonation. I'm like, I want energy. I'm not thirsty. Why are all these companies forcing me to drink something? I literally just want the stimulants out of it. And I studied biochemistry at Willamette University, and I knew that I could get these stimulants in my body quicker and more efficiently without all the junk using chewing gum as the delivery vehicle. Hmm. So we're all familiar with Nicorette. Right. Nicorette chose chewing gum to deliver nicotine to the system we chose chewing gum to deliver caffeine taurine and b vitamins to the system through the process of sublingual absorption you're absorbing these much faster and you're also bypassing the gi tract so the absorption's faster it's cleaner it's quicker we're zero sugar uh calorie free um vegan non-gmo i mean every single box you want to tick we tick and we give you an immediate boost in energy and focus. So runners love it. Marathoners aren't going to carry a 16-ounce Monster Energy drink with them on the course. Right. It's crazy, right? But they can take a packet of run gum and tuck it in their pocket. And at mile 20, when they need that boost, they have it. Um, you know, if we all travel a lot. TSA is going to take your energy drink every single time. And you right. can go to the other side of TSA and pay $5 for one. Or you can throw a you know a little packet of run gum in your pocket and you've got your energy for the other side of the flight. No jet lag, no sugar, no crash. It's just immediate energy whenever, wherever you need it. That's amazing. Can you compare it to a cup of coffee? Like if somebody yeah. did, I have heard that where a runner or somebody who's going to do a workout, they're going to drink a cup of coffee. At least it's maybe it's not so much that it's sloshing around, right? Yeah. So they drink their cup of coffee before they work out. They What's sit the around. And yeah. So, yeah. So let's compare milligrams, right? Um, and that's how most people measure uh, caffeine content. So if you drink a cup of coffee, it's going to have on average about 100 milligrams mm-hmm. of caffeine in it. If you had a Red Bull, um, a t- an 8.4 ounce Red Bull has 80 milligrams of caffeine. So what we did... And we took the efficient dose, uh, which is about 100 milligrams, and we infused it into two pieces of chewing gum, and we put those two pieces in a packet. So now when you grab your single-serving dose of caffeine, you can say to yourself, you know, I'm, I, 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 I'm highly tolerant to caffeine, as you can mm-hmm. imagine. I have a lot of caffeine each day. So I chew two pieces, and I'm, I'm just good to go for hours. But you know, my girlfriend, she's very petite. She's kind of sensitive to caffeine. She chews one piece and saves one for later. So the nice thing about the way we've, we've packaged it is that you can dial your dose into the milligram, mm-hmm. something you can't do with, with coffee. Right. Coffee will vary by as much as 100 milligrams, anywhere from 50 to 150 milligrams per cup. With run gum, you can dial in your dose to the milligram, and, and it's, I think it's safer. It's cleaner. Um, and of course, the, the the boost is so noticeable. It hits you like a train because you're getting it all through sublingual absorption. It goes straight to your brain, and you're feeling that immediately. That's insane. Yeah, that it's, is just it's a, it's a unique. Insane. It's a very unique energy product. How long has it been around? When did you come up with this? 
We launched in 2014, and I had had the concept a couple years earlier than that, and um, and I, I was always like, you know, this caffeine gum that I'm chewing every day, like people people would like this. And I t- went to my coach, and he's like, we need to create this business, but we were still training and competing around the world, so we didn't have the time and energy to put into it. And then in 2014, I got what could have been a career-ending injury. I had an avulsion fracture in my knee, and it took me out the entire year. And I I was kind of in this deep, dark depression, and you know, I went to coach and I said, I have no purpose. I wake up and I have nothing to do every day. I can't run. I can't make money. He's like, well, I think now is the time that we finally bring what we called, you know, energy gum to, to market. And so we did, we ordered a million pieces of, of this proprietary energy gum and, and packaged it and called it run gum and started selling it. And that, you know, that was four years ago. We celebrate our fourth birthday on October 14th, actually. Um, and we just announced uh, our nationwide distribution distribution partner with Target. So you can find Run Gum That's on so Target awesome. shelves nation, nationwide in the sporting goods section. And it's just kind of been a wild ride, you know, th- saw me through the peak of my career, through retirement. And now, of course, I'm, I'm full time as the CEO of Run Gum and just trying to see how far we can take this That's thing. That's awesome. Did you always think that you were going to start a business at some point? Or yeah, did that, yeah. Yeah. I've always been really entrepreneurial focused. Um, and I, I, I have, I've, created and sold or dissolved multiple businesses Mm -hmm. um you know when i was running i actually incorporated nick simmons llc that handled all the business you know uh comings and goings of of my running career um and i uh i I had been involved in franchises and you know i just i love business i love america and the the environment that we create for entrepreneurs so i just i feel really fortunate to be an american and and have the opportunity have the opportunity to create multiple businesses yeah love that okay so now I need to get some run gum because I'm very interested. I'm very interested. You shop at Target? I, I, I love do Target. Do I shop at Target? Target? Le, le Target. Of course I do. Yeah. <laughs> no, I definitely want to give that a try because I'm super interested in that. I, I feel like I've always had some sort of ca- – I know for a fact I've had a caffeine addiction. It's definitely something of oh, – when I was younger, I drank lots of pop. And when I finally realized that was a bad idea, mm-hmm. um, it was – or soda, depending on what side of the country <laughs> you're from, um, that I switched to coffee. And then I even – gave up coffee a little bit this year because I was worried that I was a little bit too addicted to it. So, but I've never, I don't feel like I've never really been able to like realize when it hit me. Mm-hmm. It's just sort of, you, you get into such a habit of just drinking caffeine. Yeah. Well, you can develop a tolerance to the caffeine. Yeah, and, and absolutely. I know people that are drinking a pot of coffee a day and mm-hmm. they like, I don't even feel it anymore. I'm like, well, stop drinking so much right, coffee. Right, right, right. Like I feel like and that's athletes, a problem. <laughs> athletes will, before a big competition, do what's called a caffeine wash, where for seven days they won't consume any caffeine so that when they get right before competition and they go and they have that pack of run gum, you know, or whatever their preferred caffeine, you know, method is, it just lights them up. That's and, awesome. and from a, from a cognitive performance standpoint, like that's really helpful in, in competition. But I, I, I was that person, right. I'm, I'm working at a caffeinated gum company. I'm chewing caffeinated gum all day long. And I'm like, I, I realize my, uh, my daily intake is getting 300, 400, right. 500 milligrams. And so I forced myself to wean myself back to 200 milligrams per day. Um, 90% of Americans use caffeine on a daily basis. And the ones that do on average consume 300 milligrams per day. So that's like three cups of coffee or three Red Bulls or three packets of run gum. And I'm on a really strict cup of coffee in the morning. And I still like the habit of just waking up with a cup of coffee and one packet of run gum in the afternoon to get me through like the two o'clock slump. And it works great for me. Yeah. What's your cup of coffee look like? I'm pretty boring. It's just, you know, pour over with a little yeah. cream and sugar. Yeah. Oh, you um, do like cream and sugar then? Yeah. You add a little flavor to it. I add a little flavor, um, some calories, because I don't eat breakfast. Okay. I'm not a big breakfast guy. And Are you, is it like an intermittent fasting thing? No. Or just, is it I've just, never I had breakfast. breakfast. I'm not a huge breakfast guy. Mm. I, I work out in the mornings, and I just can't stand the idea of anything in my stomach while I'm working out. So I have a cup of mm. coffee, and, um, you know, I just sit around and answer emails until I feel yeah. like I'm w- awake enough to go run. and. If I if I'm doing a double, like I still double sometimes, and I'll, having that packet of run gum like in the afternoon, it just it lifts me up and it gets me out the door when I'm tired after a long day of work and nothing in my stomach to slow me down. So yeah. it's still it's it's just remarkable that I, I created this product literally for international competition, and here I am a 34 year old kind of you know middle aged guy trying not to get too fat, <laughs> working my job, and I'm like this product's great just as a as an old guy that's trying to get out the door in the afternoon. <laughs> Okay, I just I feel like this is kind of funny this lead out because you're you're not running you're you're you are you are running but you're not running at like the level not a competitive you could, right? level yeah. Um, well, talk to me about my, um, is it mile to mountain? Mile to mountain is mile is, is mountain. this new concept that I have and I've always been enamored with mountaineering and okay. and pushing your limits and climbing and and travel and and the, there's a thing called the seven summits. It's the tallest mountain on every continent. Okay, and um, 
I've always been like, how cool would it be to travel to every continent and climb to the top of it? Sure. Um, and then I started doing some research and I learned that two of the greatest physical feats that humans have ever done is to run the sub four minute mile. Right. Roger Bannister, you know, did that. And to climb Mount Everest, which is uh, first accomplished by Tenzing Norgay and, and Sir Edmund Hillary. And they did it within a year of each other, which scientists really? thought that trying to push your body to the, either of those limits would kill you. Mm. And these two guys like looked at each other and they're like, okay, well, let's go <laughs> divide and conquer. <laughs> that was 54 years ago, I believe, when that happened. Something like that, 50-some mm-hmm. years ago. No one's ever done both. No human has ever broken the four-minute mile and stood on top of Everest. And scientists don't think it's physically possible. They think that the the physical requirements to be able to process in an oxygen in an anaerobic envi- environment in the, like uh, a middle distance of race like the, the mile would be so different than the skill set that you would need biologically to climb to the top of Everest in, in, in a, a, a epox- yeah. hypoxic environment. So I'm going to test that. You know, I've, I've broken four. My, my personal best in the mile is three minutes and 56 seconds. Oh, my gosh. And I've started to climb higher and higher. Earlier this year, I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro, which is the tallest mountain in Africa, right. 19,300 feet. And it wasn't easy. And I was spinning at the top, but I survived. And, and I'm, you know, eyeing even higher peaks and a hope to one day stand you on actually top of have a Do you have a podcast specific to each time that you do climb? You call from a satellite phone and just... Yeah, so we tried we, we tried that out. I actually had a sat phone um, with me on Kilimanjaro, and I called in um, updates, daily updates. Yeah, and um, it wasn't. It, I wouldn't necessarily say it was a podcast. It was more just like, you know, yeah, a sh- two minute shout out from. Yeah, the no, they're pretty quick because you, you can't. Yeah, well, it's I like imagine ten bucks a minute or something. <laughs> well, it's like ten bucks a minute too. So <laughs> oh yeah, that's not financial. So we sound. were. Uh, so we were. Um, we were just updating people because uh, you know, that's cool. A, a lot of my a lot of my fans, you know, started following me in college and followed me through the yeah. Olympic Games and. You know, I just felt like I wanted to bring my fans along for this new adventure, and you know, I was able to keep them updated, you know, with this sat receiver. And I don't know what my next mountain will be. It might be Mount Elbrus in, in southern Russia this summer, or uh, or Aconcagua is a, a much taller peak. It's 23,000 down in South America. But it, it's for me, it's a lifelong project. It's like I don't want to feel this sense of urgency and rush and, sure. and pressure that I felt when I was running. I want to just have these dreams, and I know that, you know, maybe one day I'll get up mm-hmm. to the top of each one. That's awesome. Yeah. Is it 2021 you're hoping to get to Everest? Is that sort of like the If everything timeline? comes together, you know, and, and it was it was so easy to have these, like, timelines and dreams when I was a pro athlete and had nothing else to worry about. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I'll, I got lots of time. I'll figure it out. Then you become a nine-to-fiver, you know, and yeah. a full-time, full-time employee, and like I am now. And it's like, well, I don't know that I have that much time off. Like, Everest takes six weeks to climb. I don't have six weeks of vacation time yeah. right now. So yeah, totally. I, I will uh, I will continue to dream and, and plot. And um, if everything aligns and I, I get to the top of that mountain, it'll be a, a dream come true. That's awesome. A lot of what you're talking about, it takes a lot mindset-wise. And mm-hmm. so it sounds like running is a good opportunity for you to sort of like clear the mind and get do some thinking. Kind of clear the mind and then structure the day. Like, okay, yeah. I'm like what, what all do I need to actually get done today? And is that where you go to do that thinking? Yeah. Like you don't do, is, is it just like, I know I'm going to figure it out once I just start running. Yeah. I'm like, uh, once I start running uh, kind of all the other things fade away and I have this, this very clear, sharp, crisp mindset of like, okay, I have a lot to get done today. Mm-hmm. What's the most efficient way to yeah. tackle, to vi- you know, tackle all these different things that I got to get done. So for me, that's kind of my time to just like structure my day and figure it out so is there anything else that you do for mindset like do you have um do you read on a regular basis do you have a writing practice is meditation in your game like anything like that i i want to learn how to meditate i i i I, I obviously have kind of dipped my toes into it with running and fly fishing which i think are both very meditative in nature i would like to learn how to like sit in a room and actually meditate it's a skill set that i don't have that i'd like to have um i i've never been a good writer you know i'm i'm more of like a you know, gut feeling and just let let the the ideas kind of roll around in my head rather than putting them down on paper, which is probably not the best thing for me to do. <laughs> but um, but no, it's uh, it's for me, it's just like, you know, I try to str- I try to break everything down into like bite sized chunks. You know, I think that's a that's an important skill set of of goals successful goal setters is they break them down into to bite sized chunks. And so I'll kind of say, okay, it's Q four. What do we hope to accomplish this quarter? And in order for me to be successful here, here, and here in Q4, I'm going to have to break it th- that down into weeks. Yeah. And so I'm like looking at my, my schedule and I'm saying, okay, I've got a lot to accomplish this week. 
how am I going to get my workouts in? How am I going to get, you know, my meetings done? How am I going to get enough time with my girlfriend and my dog? How am I going to make sure that, you know, there's great meals, you know, each, yeah. each evening that, that we prepare. And so for me, it's like, like I said, the morning, the morning's the time for me to set that up. And, and I, I try to, I try to take it a week at a time. Cause if I looked at how much work I need to get mm. done in the quarter, it's just overwhelming. Yeah. But it does sound like you're re- reverse engineering it essentially. You know where you need, your head needs to be in each of those quarters. I know where I want to be. Right. And now I just need to figure out the most efficient way to get there. Mm-hmm. What do you do um, when you, when you're doing that, you're saying, I, this is what I need to do this week. And also these are the things that are important to me. I need to keep up on my diet. I need to get my runs in. I need to spend time with my family and mm-hmm. I also need to get work done. What do you do? How do you schedule your life? specifically i've played around with a couple different schedules because even when i was a pro runner i i woke up and i had a workout to do and mm-hmm. that's all i really had to do that day so it was like pretty easy <laughs> it's like i don't have a whole it's lot gonna of obligations it's gonna point. happen it's <laughs> <laughs> exactly and now i now i have so many different things i'm trying to get done each day um i i always say that the most important thing that needs to happen each day should happen first because i guarantee you every day you're going to be thrown a curveball or two Maybe you get a flat tire or maybe someone calls and needs help with something. And so by getting up early and getting the most important thing for you done, you know, in those early morning hours before the, before all the curveballs come your way, it's guaranteed to get done. For me, fitness is important. And I know that it's kind of like the, the foundation that I build everything else on. Um, so I start out with my workout in the morning and then I know what's taken care of. I mm-hmm. can kind of eat what I want and... I can uh, feel more more healthy and more alert because of it. So that's how I start my day. Um, and then, you know, I, I, um, I run into work and I try to get as much done in the office as I can. Um, in the evenings, um, I like to, you know, come home. My girlfriend gets off work at 5 and we take the dog for a walk and make meals. I, I, I used to hate cooking. I, I was like, I really want to meet a, a woman that's a great cook because I hate it. Oh, but, my gosh. Uh, Men. But I, but I do most of the cooking now. Like I, really? Yeah, I do most of the cooking in the house because I, I, I enjoy it now. I've, I've learned to cool. appreciate, like, the, the, the creation process yeah. and – and uh, Tiana likes me to cook, so it's it's a, it's a good. And I, I didn't mean like I need to find a woman to cook. No, no, I'm just no, like I, I in a it. in a partnership, someone's going to have to do the cooking, right? Sure, of course. And so, of course, so I always I, thought it was going to be the man. <laughs> and, 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 and there's I also nothing out there's cook. nothing wrong with that, and there's nothing wrong no, with the woman it cooking. Be but one. You, and sometimes you know we cook together, and sometimes you know she'll cook. But I just I think I enjoy the process of it now and planning the meals. Yeah, and, you know I have found that I and I was not brought up you know, learning how to cook. My husband was uh, brought up in an Italian family where mm-hmm. it was just second nature. And mm-hmm. he makes fun of me for how I hold like knives a certain <laughs> way or whatever. Cause like, it's just in him in yeah. a different way. It's not even like he learned a skill set. It's just nature. Um, and, but I have, I don't know if you've found this, but like learning the basics of cooking and just sort of like, okay, I'm going to prep my veggies now. I do. Sometimes I'm like, throw on some like bossa nova and like just like cutting veggies. I'm like, this isn't so bad. This is a little therapeutic. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I like it. it if you're not rushed, right? If right. You, if you get home at 8 o'clock and you're like, I just, I'm starving. I need to eat. And it's already too And late. it's already 8 and I want to be yeah. in bed. You know, you're, then it's horrible. Then it's it's not fun. But, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm really fortunate to live in a, in a tiny uh, town called Eugene, Oregon. Yeah. And I don't have to worry about traffic. And we have the best farms around us. So the, we have the best <sighs> ingredients. And yeah, nice. I can come home and just kind of blow off some steam by just like cooking a nice meal. So I, awesome. I got, I got the luxury of time right now. Speaking of evening, just like wrapping this whole, like what your, what your day is like thing. What's your sleep life like? I, I, as a pro athlete, my number one training tip was don't ever wake up to an alarm clock. And I didn't, mm. it was, it was, it was a very important part of my training that I gave my body a, a, enough enough sleep, as much sleep as it demanded, right? Wow. So I would never, if I woke up to an alarm clock, I failed that day's rest. And I would go to bed about nine o'clock and wake up about seven or eight. Mm-hmm. So I was probably sleeping yeah, you know, 10 or 11 night. hours a night when I was really training. Now I don't require that much sleep and um, I don't always have the luxury of not waking up to an alarm clock, but I still aspire to do that as much as possible. So I go to sleep about nine o'clock and I wake up about five or six. Yeah, okay. Cool. Yeah, I wish I could wake up without an alarm clock. I need it. It's so nice. I really. I, mean, I actually have multiple alarm clocks. It's kind of bad. Part yeah. of it is because I don't sleep with my ro- my phone in my room. Yeah. I don't find that to be healthy. So everything is That's in my smart. office. But now I've found that I'm starting to. It's so faint in the distance. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'll let it go for a while. But I need We've it. We've got a dog alarm now. So you know what a dog dog alarm clock when is. When the dog the wakes dog you wakes up. up and it comes and just steps on my face. I have and I'm a like, fourteen okay, we're year old <laughs> blind beagle. <laughs> so you know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> I do because she does wake us up, but I. She yeah. wakes us up too much where she's yeah. now been exiled to a specific room and has to stay there. So I wish yeah. I had a dog like 
licking my face in the morning. I love yeah. you, Lucy, but that's just not you anymore. <laughs> um, do you read it all? Do I any, do, yeah. as much as I can. Um, do you have any book recommendations? Just something that has helped you from a mindset perspective of like... Um, in terms of fiction or nonfiction or both? Oh, that's curveball for me because yeah. I'm, I'm a totally a nonfictioner. I, I would say I gravitate towards nonfiction, but my mom's an English teacher really? and she reads everything and she knows specifically what my fiction preferences are. And when she get, grabs a book, she's like, this is something that you're really going to wow. like. And she's so, she know, she does this for everybody, right? She knows that uh, what Lauren, my sister likes, what, what my dad likes and what her friends like. And so she, when she reads a book, she's like, this is perfect for so-and-so. And like That's nine cool. times out of 10, she gives me a book and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Um, the first time she did that, I think was a book called The Power of One. And it's actually fiction, um, and it's about a kid growing up in in South America, uh, South Africa during apartheid, and oh. it's it's a it's a you know incredible fictional story, a novel, but it has so many life lessons in it, and I just I've read it three or four times, you know, That's since awesome. then. It's a very very good. I'm gonna link to that. Yeah. I, now I want to read a. Fresh Courtney is the author. It's it's very good, and then I do I do read a lot of nonfiction. Um, you know, mostly just kind of what I'm into at the time, you know, and when I'm thinking about daydreaming about mountain climbing, I'm reading books by mountaineers or, yeah. or, you know, actual like, um, how to climb Kilimanjaro. Yeah. There's, gu- there's guides out there about that. So I was reading no, it those makes sense. And, and I try to learn, you know, new skills and, uh, and I, I wouldn't say I'm super into like self-help necessarily, but mm-hmm. I do listen to a lot of podcasts of, yeah. of people that inspire me like Lewis Howes. It's sort of like the ongoing book you can read and yeah. in your ear the podcast yeah and I drive a ton you know in Oregon yeah. things are pretty well spread out and all right we we live in Eugene but the manufacturing and packaging takes place in Portland and so I'm up there every week and that's a you know 90 minute to two hour drive I was gonna say that's pretty far isn't yeah it, it yeah. is um and so I plug in my favorite podcast that's and awesome. it's kind of a nice time to just sit there and, and catch up on them very cool very cool so um before we close this out I have to just get some juice from you <laughs> yeah because your Wikipedia page Says Don't two always things. believe everything. You I read know, on I know. I'm, gonna, I'm about to find out if this, I'm going to look stupid. But the one thing on your Wikipedia page is it said you've been called the Brad Pitt of running. I had a, uh, a really um, interesting creative uh, publicist at one point during my pro <laughs> career, and he's like, he's like, no one knows what the 800 is, and no one follows running. We have to, we have to dub you something that mm, will be relatable. And smart so smart guy. He is very smart. smart he's guy. very smart. He's, he thinks outside the box certainly. And he understands mainstream marketing. He's, um, he, he sometimes went too far, you know, like in, in his, <laughs> but in that his one stuck on PR the stunts, that one stuck. And, uh, and you know, I mean, Brad Pitt, very handsome man. I'll take the compliment. Yeah, no, I can definitely see the resemblance. Yeah. So congratulations. <laughs> um, and the other thing is it says you have dated or you said you went on a date with Paris Hilton. Yeah, I did go on a date with Paris Hilton. That was actually set up through our publicist. And I was preparing for the 2012 games. I was mm-hmm. like, well, three weeks out from the games or something uh, or the trials. And I think she was trying to maybe clean up her image a little bit at the times. So, you know, oh, this was, yeah. This was, yeah. you know, almost half a decade ago. Um, and we, we met for drinks at, uh, at a hotel in Beverly Hills and it was awesome. I mean, I, I genuinely love first dates with anybody because you get that chance to just learn somebody's story and everybody's putting their best, their best foot forward. And it, it was, I was kind of nervous at first, but then you just kind of settle into conversation and I'm like, she's just like everybody else. And I, and I've been around enough famous people now. Um, as an athlete, you get the opportunity to be around famous people. And the one thing I'll say about anybody, whether they're, uh, you know, a C-lister or Paris Hilton yeah. or, you know, the most famous person in the world, they're humans. Yeah. You know, they eat and they poop just like everybody <laughs> yeah, else. That's right. And, and as soon as you, as soon as you look at someone, you realize that they're just a person, totally. all of that, you know, st- the, the, cele- the, um, um, this being starstruck, it just all kind of melts away and yeah. you're just having a conversation with somebody. I love that. Yeah. I imagine it, o- over this date, you ended up talking about fitness on some level, right? Yeah. Like, cause it was probably important to both of you. What was her like fitness of choice? Do you remember? Like she said she was on the road so much and this is when she was flying to yeah. a different party or different place every All the weekend. Time, and, yeah. and it was hard for her. I'm, I mean, you know, and I, 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 I don't know how she did it. And I don't know how, I don't know how, you know, real travelers do it and how they stay fit. I don't know how I'm I, doing anything. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I I, when I'm, when I'm on the road, it's, it's darn near impossible yeah, to get my workouts. And I really do love being at home and having my routine. Um, you know, as a pro athlete, of course we were on the road a lot and, yeah. and our job was to work out. But now when I'm on the road and I'm not required to, and I like look at that treadmill in the gym and I'm like, I don't really have to go spend yeah. time on the treadmill. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, Oh my gosh, random question in my head. Like, how do you feel about treadmill running versus like pavement running? It's, 
It's not the same, first off. Same. And, and people will tell you it is, and it is simply not. Um, if you put it to a 1% incline, it gets closer. And you should at le- Is it true that you should at least do that to kind of get your knees in better yeah. condition? It's, it's, it's just going to put you in better posture, okay. basically. So at least go with the 1% incline. But my big thing is an eight-minute mile on the treadmill is not the same as an eight-minute mile mm. on, on pavement, for example. What's the difference? Well, on a treadmill, you're jumping up and down, right. and you're letting the, the tread go underneath you. And on a, on a run outside, you're pushing that ground behind mm-hmm. you. So you're activating a muscle slightly differently. I would say it's 90% as effective, but if you really want to compare you know, minutes to minutes, I would say that running outside is, is – 10% better for you than, than a treadmill. But, you know, we don't always have that luxury. Sure. You know, it, sometimes uh, it's it's cold and icy out. And I would always run outside. I would It could be snowing, hailing, really? lightning, and I would run outside. Wow. The one thing I wouldn't run outside is if there was ice on the ground because it was just too big That's, a risk for injury. Yeah. And so then I'd go inside and I'd run on the treadmill and I always kind of rolled my eyes. I'm like, this sucks. But... <laughs> Uh, you got to get it done. I love that. Okay. Yeah. Before I ask you my last question, uh, I'd love to hear an, any plugging that you'd like to do. I know that you have um, Run the Day, the podcast, mm-hmm. Run Gum. Everybody needs to go try now. Go to it's, Target. It's in the sporting goods aisle, and it, it, it will give you a real quick boost. And, it, awesome. and it's a lot more affordable than alternatives. You, know, you might pay three bucks for an energy drink or a latte. Um, or even a, even a five-hour energy, I think, is like three twenty-nine yeah. in most, most stores. MSRP for a packet of run comes at $1.99. You can tuck it in your pocket, throw it in your gym bag. So we're more affordable. We're cleaner, you know, no calories, no sugar, no crash, and, and a m- much more quick boost that you can, you can really notice and bank on. So give it a try. It's at Target. Um, you can also buy it on Amazon or at rungum.com if you want to subscribe. We have a monthly subscription service. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I subscribe on Especially Amazon. people who are really into a product, right? Mm-hmm. Because you're like, I just want it. I want it. I want to hear all the time. My, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, yeah. And, I, and if you're like me, you like seeing the packages come up on, on your doorstep. And we put little gifts in there and personal notes so that people get excited oh, about them. Oh, cool. Really take care of our customer base that Very way. Very good reason to go check it out. Yeah, rungum.com. Um, you know, and other than other than that, I don't have much to plug. What's you your follow. Instagram or Twitter? I'm on both at, at Nick Simmons, and it's Simmons with a Y. And uh, it's not Simons. It's, it's not Simons. Simmons. 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 Yeah, S Y M M O N D S. Um, you know, and I I love connecting with my fans. Like I said, I try to keep them updated on what I'm up to. Um, it, it probably comes off as as too in love with run gum <laughs> because I'm really excited about our product and our you business. You guys are but having <laughs> a lot of progress right now, but it I'm is sure a hot time very for excited company, yeah. for you. Yeah. And, and we have, so, I mean, we launched it with my following and the, the, my, my fans are so awesome. They were like, yeah. where can I get this? I'm going to run out and support you. And many of them, we have subscribers today that have been with us for four years. That's awesome. That's how loyal our, our customer base is. Yeah. That is awesome. Yeah. Well, well then, and they're addicts now, so I, you know, I <laughs> they can't wean themselves off. It's fine. They love caffeine <laughs> Yeah, anyway. exactly. Well, congratulations on that. That's so amazing. Thank, Thank you, you so much for sitting down with me. I My appreciate pleasure. your time and attention. And um, I just want to ask you one final question. And what does it mean to you to go after the life that you want? You know, I think... Uh, I'm, I'm haunted by my own mortality. I know that I've got X amount of days on this mm-hmm. planet. And I think I just can't stand the, the idea of being, you know, 85 on my deathbed and looking back and being like, man, I really wasted time, didn't I? And so, you know, when you, when you really come to understand just how limited your time is here, you, you start saying, I'm going to make the most of it because I just don't have that much. Um, you know, and I, I, you, you hear, um, you, you know, they'll, they'll, the people will interview people on their deathbed and say, what, what are your biggest regrets? And more often than not, it's, I wish I had spent more time doing the things that I was passionate about. I wish I'd spent more time with my family. I wish I'd spent more time with my hobbies. No one ever says, I wish I'd worked harder. No one ever mm-hmm. says that. So I'm working hard um, because I enjoy it, you know, and I'm working hard to create the lifestyle that will allow me to, to ultimately spend more time with my family and spend more time doing my hobbies. And, and, um, I think that I'm trying to get to a point where the work that I'm doing is my hobby. And you must understand what I'm mm-hmm. saying. You, you mentioned that you have, you know, your hands in a lot of different, um, uh, uh, you're a lot of different irons in the fire. Mm-hmm. And some of those must just be, you know, almost just passions for you. Yeah. You, you can't, you can't Absolutely. be as busy as you are with so many things going on if you don't actually enjoy some of the things Absolutely. that you're doing. And obviously we all want to kind of, move towards that and away from the, the grind, the stuff that we don't like. And I think that that's one of the nice things about growing older for you young listeners, growing old, isn't that bad. And I'm not old, but, but as you get older, you get to set aside more of the stuff that you don't like and focus on the stuff that you really do. You get that luxury. I love that. 
Thank you so much for being on today, Nick. Thank you so much for having me. Here's a quick detail recap. Being great at something often starts when you think you're worthy of that greatness. When a person thinks and shows that they have an affinity and a talent for something, other people will flock to them naturally. This isn't always for personal gain either. Sometimes they just really like you. Know when to work and when to play. If you're going to work, work hard and give it all you've got. When it's time to decompress and de-stress, Fully commit to that mindset in order to really recharge. And try Run Gum. If you're not an energy drink fan and you're feeling a little bored with your coffee, Run Gum might be the answer for you. Not only does the gum seem awesome, the story behind its origin and its creation is unique as well. I'm headed out to Target right away. Again, all of the details for this podcast are in the show notes over at detailspodcast.com. I've never really been a runner, but if the Brad Pitt of running says that it's worth a shot, I'm all for it. Do you love getting advice straight to your earbuds? Would you like some simple steps for living your best life every day? Then Amy wants to send you her free audio training with the seven essential details for going after the life that you want. To receive this audiogram, subscribe to this podcast and take a screenshot to show you're subscribed. Email your screenshot to hello at detailspodcast.com with audiogram please in the subject line, and we'll send it right over to you. Thank you for tuning in today. Amy appreciates it, as always. If you want to discover even more actionable details, head over to Amy TV by typing the URL in your browser, youtube.com slash Amy TV, or search for Amy Landino in your YouTube app. As Amy says, subscribe for good vibes, and remember to go after the life that you want. Cheers.